Well, thank you. Okay, Michael, you, I'm out of the screen again. Okay. So put me back in the screen. Thank you very much. Yes, yes, yes that's not working. I've done this. There oh, you go. Uh, <laughs> all right. So uh, this is your world history to SOL2. Mr. Anderson and I are starting from the top with world history two. So, and this is the world around 1500, um, the beginning of modernity, right? So we got, we're gonna look at some major states. State is a new concept that's a place with borders and a government and population and empires, right? We're gonna describe art, literature, and ideas of the Renaissance. What is, what, what is the word Renaissance? Rebirth, my rebirth, rebirth, rebirth. The rebirth of what? We'll talk about. Okay. Roman culture. I'm okay. going to give you a spoiler. Roman culture. Of the Greek classics, culture. right? But with a little, with a little modern twist, right? With a little modern twist <laughs> called humanism. All right. So we're going to describe the major religions in the world in 1500. We're going to look at trade, and we'll look at major technological and scientific exchanges as in things that were brought east to west. All right. Let's take a look. For most of you that studied World History I, this is just going to be a review. We're going to study the major states that are happening in the Eastern Hemisphere during this time period. Uh, we covered almost all of these in World History I. So like I said, this should be a good review. So most of you should know where England is. England is where we talked about King John and the Magna Carta. We talked about Henry II and common law. We talked about France. Remember, France had a war with England, the Hundred Years' War. We talked about Spain. Spain during this time period is going to be the one of the most wealthy nations in the 1500s because of what happened with Charles V. Charles V had all of the goods he was taking from the Americas and bringing all that gold, all those natural resources to Spain, making him able to build the Spanish Armada, making it possible for him to buy the best weapons. We learned about the, the Russians. The Russians during this time period are going to become very important. They're going to get one of their most famous leaders in the next century by the name of Peter the Great, which is going to modernize this huge Russian country. The Ottoman Turks we talked about. Remember, the Ottoman Turks replaced the Byzantine Empire in 1453. They took over the city of Constantinople, and they take that city over. They rename it. They rename it what, Mr. Pierce? Istanbul. Istanbul. To this very day, you can go to the city of Istanbul, the Ottoman capital, which is now the capital of Turkey. Turkey. Well, Persia's the Persians become a powerful nation again, and Persia itself winds up becoming the modern day country of Iran. Iran. China during this time period develops a massive navy, and a lot of new technolo uh, technology is going to be coming out of China. We're going to learn about the Mughals in India. Now, the Mughals are known for their architectural advancements, and that they're the first Islamic civilization to take over the uh, 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 subcontinent of India. And they have that in common with the Songhai in Africa, because the Songhai is one of the first Islamic uh, 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 kingdoms in West Africa, the sub-Saharan trade. They're also one of the last of the great West African kingdoms. And, and um, after the Songhai collapses, the European countries are going to use that, uh, you know, Songhai and Mali. Once, uh, you know, once those great West African empires fail, um, the European power is going to use that as an excuse to colonize Africa and well, take control take, of the slavery. Take the natural resources that are in Africa right. and the people. Right. All right, let's look at the map here. You're going to notice that we're going to start with England here. England, right there, you got the English Channel separating from uh, what they used to call uh, Fortress Europe. There's the uh, British, uh, British Canal, the English Channel. This is Scotland, Ireland, and there's England. There's France. France was one of the largest nations, not just by land mass, but also by population, making a very powerful nation in Europe. There's Spain. Spain during the 1500s was exceedingly powerful because of wink, money. No. They were just throwing out money. Then you got the Ottomans. The Ottomans take over. You notice this is going to look awful similar to, you, to the Byzantine Empire because the Ottomans basically take over the old Byzantine Empire. What did the Byzantines actually call themselves? They called themselves Romans because they're the old East Roman Empire. Some people say the Roman Empire didn't fall until 1453. But the SOL says the Western Roman Empire fell in 476. And so what the SOL says is correct. Right. 
And then you okay. got Mother Russia. Mother Russia. That's my Russian accent. Russia, that's pretty good. You're welcome. I, I have a gift for accents. This is Russia, and Russia becomes very powerful under the leadership of Peter the Great, who builds a navy, builds a new capital for it. So let's see what's next here. We got China. Hmm. China builds a great navy. Mr. So Pierce. China built a massive navy, 1,600 ships, and these were huge things. So like the, the, there's a famous Chinese admiral, his name is Zheng He, and he built what were called the treasure ships, and some of them were as large as a football field, three times larger than any of the ships in something like the, the Spanish Armada was supposed to be this fear navy. There was only 132 ships and they were small compared to these Chinese ships. And he sailed all through that route that Mr. Anderson just all the way down around uh, through Southeast Asia um, and around India. And he would periodically stop in and demand tribute from various rulers. Um, and this navy was immense. And if he had gone a little farther, um, you know, it, it's very possible the Chinese could have been the first to maybe even circumnavigate the globe. Well, I actually read a book about, let's see, I've been teaching here 16 years. So 17 years ago, I read a book about, it's called 1443. Yeah. And they talk about how the Chinese probably sailed around the earth, circumnavigated. Their, their, their ships were certainly capable of doing it. Um, and so, but what happened was you had sort of like uh, uh, elite people, high ranking people in China. And they were a little suspicious. So these, these merchants, these traders, were becoming really rich and powerful, and they didn't like that. And so they wanted to put a stop to that. And they also had, uh, you know, to deal with, um, you know, nomadic raiders, Mongols, you know, enroaching on their territory. And so they pretty much put a stop to all the expeditions, and they actually made a law that said you couldn't build a ship with more than one mast. Oh, and so they put a stop to all the big treasure ships, and the Chinese stopped their their sort of naval preeminence. They became isolation. They did. And here's the Mogul Empire. Now, the Mogul Empire is famous not just because it's Muslim, but they also have one of the most famous buildings on Earth. That would be the Taj Mahal. It's, it's Mike Pierce's house in India. It's huge. So you have this Taj Mahal. It was built by a famous uh, Mogul king whose wife passed away, and he was mourning, and he had this huge... Uh, 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 building built for her as a place for her to rest. And here's your Persian Empire, which becomes, as I said, Persia, this is all Persia. Modern day Iran. And it's basically yeah. modern day Iran. And there is Timbuktu. This is the Sung House. Cosmopolitan Timbuktu, center of learning, center of trade. What right? kind of mosque do they make? It's at that little bend on the uh, Niger River there. And then if you look at the, the Mosque of Jen, that's that UNESCO World Heritage Site, very famous mud mosque that's replastered every year and that has been there for centuries. Um, Timbuktu, synonymous today with the middle of nowhere, but in 1500 was the place to be. It was happening. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, European visitors remarked about how just um, the leaders of Timbuktu uh, were. They had a very strong sense of justice. And it was a very um, equitable kind of society that existed there. And this we talked about when we talked about the sub-Saharan trade. Sub meaning below, so that line being the Sahara Desert. Yep. And these traders coming across would go to Timbuktu. Exactly. The beautiful city of Timbuktu. Now, it's worth mentioning right now that if you look at Shanghai, we, in, you know, when you're in World One, you talk about Mali, you talk about Ghana, you talk about these West African empires. Um, eventually... Uh, these West African empires will collapse, um, and Europeans are going to use that as an excuse to kind of imperialize Africa. And so the slave trade will pull people from West Africa and the Guinea coast, that's that southward-facing coast of Africa there. And so most of the folks that come across in that, that middle passage, that infamous transatlantic voyage of the slave trade, came from West Africa and the Guinea coast. Again, we're talking about the Mughal Empire. This is represented by the subcontinent of India. The Mughal Empire is one of the first continents, or one of the first uh, em uh, empires in India to be Islamic. I remember 
When you talk about India, India is a subcontinent because of the isolation. It's isolated because right here you got a mountain chain called the Hindu Kush, and right here you can see it's spelled out the Himalayas. So if you're going to do trade with Mongols, you're going to have to or Mongols, the Mongols, you're going to have to do it by sea, or you're going to have to go through the Khyber. Now, what's interesting about that? The, you know, like so, so India is geographically isolated. So what does that mean for the culture? Of India. They're going to be able to keep their culture pretty much the same as it was from the beginning. There's a lot of examples. Like, think of Egypt, same thing. Uh, cataracts on the Nile, a desert and seas. Think of China, right? So these places that are geographically isolated are also going to be able to kind of keep their culture intact a little, you know, more readily than, say, places like in Mesopotamia, like in the Tigris and Euphrates river valleys. Very true. Mm -hmm. Now, we already talked about these when we talked about World 1, so this should be a review for you. This right here, these are the American civilizations that we studied. The Inca is the only civilization we talked about in South America. When we talk about the Inca, you have cities like Cusco being the capital city, but the city we know is the city of Machu Picchu, which is a city in the clouds. It's actually a holy city. Yeah. It's a city of reverence that they have there. This is the Mayan civilization. When you guys get older, you're going to want to go to Cancun and whoop it up. <laughs> whoop, whoop. Well, that's where the Mayan you civilization You can't go there now, though. You can't go, you can't there, go now. there now. No, don't congregate in groups larger than 10. That's true. And the Mayan civilization right here on the Yucatan Peninsula, and they were represented by the city of Chichen Itza. Although they did not have one capital city, the Mayans were represented by a bunch of small city states. And then you have your Aztecs. Your Aztecs were located in the arid part of Mexico, central Mexico, and they were represented by the city of Tenochtitlan, which was in the middle of Lake Texcoco. It's a massive city that rivaled anything in Europe during its time. I, I, I want to say that the Aztec Empire, right, or these empires combined something like 25 million people, uh, just huge numbers. And so it's worth mentioning that if you look at these, these empires that existed, and you look at like China and some of the, those Eastern empires, Europe looks a little bit like a backwater. So how does Europe uh, go from being a relative backwater to, to ultimately becoming very powerful and then imposing its will on all of these other places? And we'll, we'll talk about that as we go through the course. You know what also the Aztecs did? Sacrifice people. Okay, you went a different direction. Okay, I was right. going to say they made chocolate. Oh, okay. They, well, they had chocolate. All right. And I guess they sacrificed. And human sacrifices. Yeah, yes. Okay. Yeah. They also had avocados. The mines. Avocados, avocados are, are delicious and good They're for your good for me. Yes, they're good for your blood pressure. And they have corn, and maize, if maize. you will. Yeah, maize. Now let's talk about the Renaissance. What the is Renaissance, what means Renaissance mean? The rebirth. The ah. rebirth of what? That'd be Greek and Roman culture. What mm. happened is, is during the Middle Ages, they lost the ability to build the design, the buildings, the architecture that they had in Rome and Greece. Things like the Parthenon, the Pantheon. You have these great Roman aqueducts that were being built, and in the Middle Ages, they were like, did ancient aliens build those? I think not. It was the Romans and Greeks. So they start restudying the Romans and the Greeks. And this is possible because of two things that happened. The first one is the Crusades. The Crusades happen, and you have cultural diffusion going on between the uh, Muslims and the European Christians, where goods are being transported across the Mediterranean with trade. And you have the bubonic plague. Now, the bubonic plague happened in 13, was it 1347 uh, to 1354, I believe. And during that time period, during the bubonic plague, what happens is people start losing faith in the church. Remember, in the Middle Ages, the church was everything. Everything was about reaching your final goal, heaven. But when people started to doubt the church, because the church said they could cure the bubonic plague, they knew why the plague was happening. It was because of your sins. But it wasn't your sins. It was the fleas on rats. It was your poor hygiene that did it, not your religious beliefs. So what happened is people started to lose faith in that, and they had to find something to put their faith in, and they start looking into science. This brings us, to, if you look at this word right here, secular, and that, that sort of means, you know, um, uh, aside from or departing from religious explanations for things. Secular things are sort of a-religious things, right? And so a secular education becomes a thing during the Renaissance. Now, now prior to this, um, Europeans really believe in something called the great chain of being, where they saw themselves as sort of one cog in the machine, basically 
you had God, you had the king, you had maybe nobles and upper classes, and then, you know, if you were a commoner, you were down, you know, and then below you were like rocks and dirt and animals and things like that. The closer you are to the ground, um, the lower you are in the great chain of being. Well, now that idea is kind of going away, and, and we're starting down this road of looking at our relationship. To our, uh, with our rulers and with the natural world in, in scientific terms. And, and you can even see it in the art. And so uh, we're going to talk about something called humanism. But um, the art, you see a rebirth of the classics, but with a sort of a, a, a twist of modernity. So like in the Middle Ages, you, you know, the artists would never take credit for their work because it was just you're supposed to give all the glory to God. But um, in the Renaissance, you knew who the artists were that made the stuff. This Their names the, were well known. Go ahead, Mr. Anderson. This is the Pieta, and to go on that fact, Michelangelo carved his name right. across her dress so people would know that he actually made this. You would not have seen so that real Yeah. It also has the Greek and Roman influence that the Romans and Greeks like to celebrate the human body. So you had nudes in their art. Like this is Michelangelo's ceiling of the 16th chapel. And notice, Adam's nude. But he's celebrating the nude body. He's shredded. He's showing the muscles. The, uh, you know, they're shredded. They're celebrating the human and, body. And these uh, depictions are made to look as human as possible. Uh, and, and we'll talk about humanism. But the point is to make them look real. Make them look human. Uh, remember, we're getting away from sort of more mythical kind of religious things and focusing on individual people and the secular. Okay, when you talk about the Renaissance, you got to talk about the visual art that was happening during this time period. You got Michelangelo, who did the great painting of the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. He did statues like the David, this 12 foot tall or 10 foot tall statue of a nude David. You have him doing the Pieta, just all kinds of beautiful artwork done by him. You have Leonardo that did the Mona Lisa in the Last Supper. He he also was a, a Renaissance man to. to to create uh, a shoes that walked on water, which failed, but he tried. He created the first helicopter. It didn't work, but he thought about all of these new inventions that eventually come into the modern society. Leonardo was thinking about 500 years ago. You have advancements in literature. Shakespeare comes in and he starts writing stories about love. Love is a new concept. It's the concept brought in with humanism. Now, what is humanism, Mike? Right? Humanism, we're, we're focusing, we're not part of the great chain of being anymore. We're not just cogs in the machine. It's very much about the individual person. And you can look at this, even, you know, the people at the top, the rulers, the Renaissance princes, you know, um, they're focusing on, you know, what they need to do to be the best ruler, right? So they need to appear religious and appear to have all these virtues. They're supposed to be virtues of rulers. Um, the art. The art is very realistic. It's very human. And the education very focuses on the, it's, it's more on the here and now and not the life after. And so you can say that in the age of humanism, people are more worried about um, or becoming more concerned with their life on earth, whereas in the Middle Ages, it was all about after your life on earth and when you die. And humanism, humanism was basically brought about by uh, Petrarch. Petrarch wrote sonnets to Laura, a woman who he was kind of stalking. And we talked about this in World History One. He loved her from afar and never let her know. And then when she died, he had all these sonnets he'd written for her. It was an unrequited love. And everyone would read these sonnets and all their lady friends would be like, hey, where's my sonnet? And some guy would be like, I'm writing one right now. And even to this day, people will write love poems to each other, which can trace it back. Love is a human feeling. Mm -hmm. Humanism is the focus on the individual. So going back to a human emotion, such as love, brings about things like uh, Shakespeare, who writes Romeo and Juliet, which is dealing about this love affair that happens. And it's very much a sort of here and now, you know, caught up in the moment kind of story. 
you know, and, and a big departure from that. All that matters is that you do your duty and the great chain of being so that, you know, in, in when you when you pass off, when you, you know, when you die, you go to heaven and, and your life after this one matters more than your current life. And then you run into people like Erasmus. Erasmus wrote the praise of follies. And just by the name itself, praise of follies, you can tell that this monk was not singing the praises of the church, but actually talking about how the inner workings of the Catholic church was not very functional and how it wasn't meeting its goal. It was a praise of folly. Yeah. So when you talk about the Renaissance, you got to talk about the infrastructure, the arts and the visual art and the written art. Machiavelli writes a very famous book called The Prince, where he, he from a humanist perspective, is, is trying to advise his prince on how to be a good sort of Renaissance ruler, right? And he says, hey, listen, um, you know, you need to, you don't have to be religious. You just need to appear to be religious. You have to have all of these virtues that are supposed to be the virtues of a good ruler. And it's really just focused on, hey, you need to be the best ruler you can here. Don't worry about the afterlife. Uh, the here and now is what matters. And you guys remember Machiavelli. We studied him in World War. Right. The ends justify the means. The ends justify the means. There you go. Okay, the locations of world religions in the 1500s. What happens is this, Judaism. Judaism starts off, the largest Jewish population in the Middle Ages lived in Spain. But we talk about the reconquista, the reconquest of Spain. And in the reconquest of Spain, the Muslims and Jews were forced to leave. They were forced to leave Spain. Well, they had to find somewhere else to go. And a large portion of these Jews, some of them filtered back down to the Middle East. But a large portion of them also filtered into what is modern day Poland. And that's going to have repercussions when we talk about World War II, because World War II starts in 1939. And that's the first place that Hitler invades. And when he invades, there's 10 million Jews that live in Poland at that time. So there's going to be a lot of Jews being persecuted. And it all traces back to its roots of what happened in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, where the Spanish forced the Muslims and the Jews out of Spain, and the Jews broke off, and some go down to the Middle East, and some go into Poland. Christianity uh, uh, is concentrated in Europe. There is some in the Middle East. You have some Orthodox Christians in the Middle East, like the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is in the Middle East. But the bulk of Christianity is going to rest right in Europe. And you got to remember, at this time period, there's not a large population in the Americas of Christians. During the 1500s, there's not a lot of Christians in the Americas yet. Eventually, it's going to become large, but at this point in history, it's not. Why don't you tell me about the, uh, uh, the Muslims? So Islam is going to diffuse across Asia and Africa into sub-Saharan Africa. Remember that Islam is spreading along those trade routes. Um, and it's going to, um, uh, it's going to spread um, into sub-Saharan Africa. Um, uh, it's going to, the Ottoman Turks are going to control a, a wide swath of territory. Um, and then they're actually pretty tolerant compared to other civilizations of other religions existing within their empire. And so you could be Christian or Jewish or whatever within the Ottoman Empire, um, although um, you were encouraged to convert. There were advantages to conversion. Um, and the Ottomans are actually going to start basically pushing into Europe. And so like we talked about, we talked about the, the siege of Constantinople. Eventually Constantinople is going to fall to the Ottoman Turks and Southern Europe is going to become Islamic. And if you look at like uh, Turkey today is part of the European Union, Turkey, the city of Istanbul, runs Constantinople. Um, Hinduism um, is a very much an Indian religion. And you guys know a little bit about it. I think you talk about the tenets of Hinduism in World One. Remember that this is a, um, and it has a pantheon. It's a polytheistic religion with many, many gods. Um, India is going to develop a caste system based on Hinduism. Um, and it's going to also spread to places like, uh, so Angkor Wat, I believe, is, is central in Bodhi. Mm -hmm. um, and was originally a, a Hindu temple. And later on, it's going to be occupied by by Buddhists. So now Buddhism um, is, I guess you could you can call it a religion, um, but in a lot of ways it's it's sort of the, an ideology, a philosophy, 
a philosophy, if you will. And it's, it's sort of this idea about, you know, self-realization, um, you know, you, through aesthetic self-denial and through meditation, um, you know, you, you achieve, you know, you become your best self. And so um, there's some evidence to suggest that Buddhism is, is one of the oldest sort of philosophy slash religions in the world, if you will. Uh, you know, it, it could even predate written history. And there's evidence that, um, you know, there's a very famous picture of the Buddha sitting in a deer park. And they, and they have found things at very, very old archaeological sites like Mahenya Daro, um, where uh, this sort of deer park, yogic kind of sitting person in a deer park, um, it alludes to maybe Buddhism being a than we think it is. Um, it is in East Asia, so think Japan. Um, in modern day um, Korea and on the Korean Peninsula, um, and also in Southeast Asia. Usually, when they talk about the earliest religions, they usually call Hinduism the oldest. And after Hinduism, usually comes Buddhism, then it comes to Judaism, then it comes to Christianity, then it comes to Islam. Right. So, the early religions, and basically what we're talking about is the early religions in the East. There you go. Right, so we're looking at uh, the world in 1500, and we're looking at the major states and empires that had developed in various regions in the world. We're looking at new ideas that are manifesting in, in art, um, in the way people are learning, um, in the literature that they're creating. And remember, we're talking about the Renaissance, the rebirth, the rebirth of the classics, but also um, the birth of modernity. Remember that there's a new idea and that is emergent. It's a secular idea about the world in which the here and now kind of matters more than the life after. Um, so by 1500, the five world religions had spread to most of the areas of the Eastern Hemisphere. Okay, whenever you talk about trade or whenever you talk about a culture, you gotta talk about trade. Trade's always been a major issue. Now, one of the biggest trade routes we talked about is something called the Silk Road. Now, most of you remember the Silk Road from World History One. But the Silk Road is a major trade route that links Asia to Europe. And along that, they trade things like what, Mike? Like paper and gunpowder. And silk. And silk. silk. Hence the name, Silk Road. There Spices are also very viable being brought into the Mediterranean basis. You got the maritime routes. Whenever you think of maritime, Think of the Maritime Museum down in Delft. I was talking about water. So these are maritime routes that they would take into the Indian Ocean. What's happening is the Ottoman Empire controlled Asia Minor. Well, Asia Minor is where the Silk Road runs into. So the Silk Road is being taxed by the Ottomans. So what they decided to do was is that they would go a little bit down the, the Nile River, and then they would portage to the uh, Red Sea, and they would take boats from the Red Sea all the way down past the uh, Straits of Aden into the Gulf of Aden and into the Arabian Sea and then into the Indian Ocean. And they would do trade with the Indian, with the Asians through this maritime routes. You got the Trans-Sahara routes in North Africa. How big were some of those caravans, Mr. Pierce? They were massive. So you'd have a, maybe a camel train of like 25,000 camels. 25,000 camels. That's, that's a, a lot that's of camels. A, that's enough for everybody in Millsex to have two and a half camels. I don't know what I'd do with two and a half camels. I don't know what I'd do with half a camel. I know if I had two, I'd... I, I, I don't know. I trade. You trade. There you I go. don't know. So you got lost in that one. <laughs> what happens in Northern Europe links to the Black Sea? We talked about this. This is your trade routes the Vikings made. They'd go from the Baltic Sea down the Dnieper River into the Black Sea, and they would trade with Constantinople. And we know they trade furs from archaeological sites we have found in Russia. Western European sea and river things. Whenever we think of Western Europe, you got to think of the rivers. Paris is on the Seine. London's on the Thames. Rome is on the uh, 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 Tiger. London is, is uh, located at a narrow spot along the Thames River. Uh, it, it's there for a reason. It's an easy river crossing, a great place to trade. Um, the, the Seine River, um, uh, Paris started as a, uh, on an island in that river. So these are great because they're strategic. They're great because they lie along key trade routes. And by 1500, trade is the way. So Rome's on the Tiber, you go up and you go into Russia, Moscow, Moscow's on the Volga River. You have all these cities on these major rivers, and they're the highways. 
that the uh, people in the uh, 1500s would use. South China Sea, of course, you just got to find China and go south. Hence, you'll find the South China Sea. This is right next to the South China Sea. It's also right next to Southeast Asia, which you'll remember is Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. The important parts is the trade, the exchange of goods and ideas. Cultural diffusion happened. It wasn't just trade. They were trading ideas. So trading ideas, like, so if you look at the, the European powers uh, going forward for 1500, they have gunpowder armies. They have celestial navigation. Um, they have all sorts of instruments that they can use and the math to travel across oceans. They're going to get all of this from Eastern empires. Gunpowder armies and how to use them in battle, um, the ability to, to, to sail and navigate across uh, vast distances is all going to come from the east and it's going to diffuse along these trade routes west and that is going to radically change the world in which we live. Okay, as you saw on the map on the previous slide, that map is a map of the major trade routes, the Silk Road and the maritime routes that were located in the east. Now, the items that they were trading were things like paper, the compass. The compass is huge because before, how do you know which direction you're sailing? Is you had to look at the stars. Well, that doesn't apply to someone sailing during the day. So the compass you can use any time of the day. It's going to tell you where true north is. You're going to have silk, which is an excellent textile. And you're going to have porcelain. We're not talking about toilets here. We're talking about your mom's fine china. Beautiful Chinese uh, 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 pieces of porcelain that are still valuable to this day. Don't forget about gunpowder. You're going to have gunpowder come out of China too. And so things like paper, but then think about the impact that paper is going to have. People can write down ideas, transport them across great distances, and share them with other people. Well, what does that mean? That means religion. That means I, uh, theory, that means math and science are going to spread, uh, not just across space, along the Saharan trade routes and the Silk Road, but across time, too. Um, and that's going to be really important. And, of course, you could imagine what kind of impact gunpowder is going to have. Could be a bang. Yes, no pun intended. Textiles right. is going to be big. People are going to start wearing different types of clothing because now you have all these different uh, civilizations come together, and you're going to have clothing developed. New, uh, the numeral system, the numeral system that we use actually developed in India in the Gupta Empire and through cultural diffusion you have the Muslims using it and then the, you have the Europeans doing trade with the Muslims and they just assume it's the Arabic numeral system and that's how we get our number system through cultural diffusion from the Middle East. You have scientific transfer. Medicine starts getting a little better because of uh, the advancements that the Muslims were doing. You have astronomy and advancements in mathematics. Things like decimals. And, and the concept of zero uh, are going to radically change the way Europeans think of your business. So again, by 1500, we have all of these regional trade patterns. It, it's really important to understand that for this to work, you, you've got to have these trade routes, but you also need these big empires so that those trade routes are secure. And you've got that. So you've got big empires, you've got secure trade routes, and that's going to give you all of this movement of people and goods and ideas. Um, and also the people themselves. Um, they, 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 I want to highlight that point. Uh, some people are transient. They're going to leave their mark either by transporting culture or, or knowledge or whatever. But some people are going to get up and go different places and stay there. And so pretty soon we're going to be talking about, you know, the age of, exploration and we're going to see lots of people moving permanently migrating all around the world and changing the world fundamentally some voluntarily some involuntarily but have, making irrevocable uh, you know irreversible changes on um, you know where people live on populations around the world so by 1500 there are all sorts of technological and scientific advancements as well that had been exchanged that we talked about like gunpowder and the compass and paper from China. We talked about math uh, from India and astronomy. Um, all of these things combined um, to start um, an age of scientific advancement, an age of exploration. All right, now I want you guys to go through and try to answer these on your own. 
these questions here. Ooh. There we go. <laughs> these questions. I want to see if you can answer these. I guys thought it's like a, on your a own. pair of pants or maybe like a, a snorkel. I was trying clothes. to make a pair of Oakley sunglasses. Oakley sunglasses. Don't you that's see the nose? That's where your nose and your you eyepieces here. Don't worry, it's going to fade away. There we go. It's gone. Now, this is the end of our video of me and Mr. Pierce. Uh, hopefully, it was helpful. The, we'll be trying to make more. This is a standard two. Our next one will be over standard three. And remember, I have not taught World History Two since 1999, before all of you were born. And I've never. So, right. I hope you guys enjoy this, and remember, just don't sit there and giggle. Go through and see what you can do, and make sure you're learning something so that we're not wasting our time. And check out our U.S. History and World One videos as well. They're informative, uh, you know, pretty good also. All right. Yeah.